All right. Getting some feedback, Brady. Hello, everyone. If you're just joining us, please enjoy this video. I'm about to launch and we'll get started in just a moment. Ribera del Duero is home to the king, Spain's most notable of its noble grapes, Tempranillo. Tempranillo is made to perfectly pair with cheeses that are layered, complex, smooth, and elegant, which align with the fruit finishes. Crianza cries for San Simon. Reserva requires a reserved cheddar like features, and Gran Reserva commands a date with Cabot Cloth Down Cheddar and Point Reyes Bay Blue. Mimic rich, complex flavors, and you'll have a board that is sure to wow. Discover Ribera y Rueda, Spain's most prestigious regions for red and white wines. Enjoy! Welcome all to Spain's most prestigious red and white wine, red and white wine, wine, wine drink, Real Spain and Anthony Giglio. Today is Wednesday, April 6th, and my name is Brittany Chisholm. I'll be your MC for the evening. Briefly, before we start the program, a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions as we go along, please post those in chat. Chances are someone else has the same question as you. Also, please remain muted unless asked to voice your question live to the entire group. That'll just keep the noise uh, down in the room. I will be spotlighting Anthony as we go, but if at any point you're not seeing what you think you should, you might be in gallery view. Uh, look for those words in the top right corner and toggle that on to speaker view. Again, assuming Zoom cooperates, we'll manage this for you. Uh, if you are joining us on social media via our live broadcast, please feel free to post comments there as well. And we do hope you'll join us for the next tasting. Uh, the April tasting package is available now on drinkrealspain.com and quantities are limited. Now for some quick reminders about setting your table. You should have chilled your wine, even the red. You should also have snacks because we can't taste fully without tasting it with a little salt and a little fat. Uh, things like cheese, charcuterie, salted nuts, and even potato chips. Next, pour each wine into its own glass and place the bottle behind it so you know which wine is which. Repeat this for everyone enjoying the wine with you. And finally, please make sure you've got plenty of water. Uh, so we can get started. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Anthony Giglio. Anthony, according to his mother, but maybe not his wife, is one of the most entertaining wine and spirit authorities on the planet. He's the wine director for American Express Centurion Lounges, contributing wine editor for Food and Wine Magazine, as well as a food critic. And most importantly, he's a psalm and culinary expert. Anthony, thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Brittany. Guys, I'm so happy to be here. I have four delicious bottles, all in a nice bucket, perfectly chilled. And uh, we are getting ready to kick off with um, my, uh, my, my favorite partners from uh, Drink Real Spain. If you haven't signed up yet, please do. If you're on IG Live, I put the link in the title. And if you're here at Drink Real Spain on, on IG, it'll take you right there. Each month features, it's a really cool program, each month features four new wines from the Ribera and Rueda regions of Spain, shipped from small independent retailers. Um, last month and this month, we uh, worked with Verve Wines in New York City. Um, they also have stores in Chicago and San Francisco. I, I, they're one of my favorite retail partners to work with. Uh, and I've, we've done a ton of business through the pandemic. And that's why I wanted to go to them because they will get the wine to your door. Um, and now I want to introduce Brady Lowe. He's the manager of Ribera and Rueda campaign. Anything to add, Brady? Let's hear it, man. Well, I mean, it is a good old Wednesday afternoon here in uh, Drinkingville. And it's exciting to have you guys all here. Um, I see a lot of friendly faces and, you know, Anthony, it's always a pleasure and an honor to be sitting, you know, side by side with a professional drinker like yourself, who does a bunch of amazing things all year round. Um, you know, Ribera and Rueda are two really prestigious wine regions in Spain. And I've been traveling to, you know, the region since uh, I was hitchhiking in college. I read a book about Jack Kerouac who went across uh, Spain and I thought it was one of those most kind of magical miracle places that I wanted to go to. So essentially I did that. And we went um, to Rioja and a bunch of other regions in the month of August which basically means nobody's home. <laughs> <laughs> so do your homework if you're gonna go travel. Um, but what I really loved about the whole opportunity is Ribera and Rueda are 
a region known for white wines and red wines and to basically be able to put these together in a monthly package to work with stars like Anthony and have influencer buddies and everybody here tonight to kind of partake in two bottles of white and red. It's really a cool opportunity. Um, so, you know, kudos to you, Anthony, for being here tonight and teeing this off. Ready. All right, guys, are you ready? I hope you have your uh, your wines out and uh, you already took the corks out. Uh, a little public service announcement. If anybody hasn't opened the wines yet and you're dealing with the troublesome wax seal that uh, is on the bottle, the two of the four bottles, um, drill right through. Just don't freak out about this. Do not melt it. I've seen people dip it in hot water. I've seen people try and scrape it off with a with a with a with a knife. Just drill through it. When you pull the cork out, it will crack the seal, and then you can neatly use the knife on your on your wine uh, opener and just take a little bit more of the edge off and leave it clean like that. Um, on the uh, on the pico, uh, I'm sorry, on the pico row, it didn't. It came right off. The whole thing just came off. So we'll get to that one in a minute. But um, sort of by just explaining a little bit about my my context with Spain. Um, I have to, being a, an Italian kid from Jersey, um, and we are live right now in my my amazingly stocked dining room in Jersey City, New Jersey, where I've been pandemicking, uh, hosting over 400 virtual wine tastings since the pandemic began, uh, getting everybody four bottles of wine from, from Verve Wine Shop in New York, uh, all over the country. And, and I've worked uh, in over nine countries around the world, hosting over 14,000 people. So it's, it's been quite fun, but it always comes back to, oh, you're from Jersey, you're an Italian kid from Jersey. Uh, what's your favorite Italian wine? And here's the truth, guys. I've been saying my entire career, which is three decades, um, that uh, I don't uh, have any particular favorite regions. I like any wine, especially if it's free. Um, I do have a, a, a real, real love of of uh, the France's Rhone region, and it just, it extends directly into into Spain with with some of the same grapes. Um, I hurt I hurt a lot of Italian Americans by not saying I'm a big you know I'm a, oh, I love. Chianti, or I love this, or I love that. I love all wine, honestly. I'm, I'm always open to taste things, but it's really funny. People expect that. But one thing I've said on every single tasting I've done, and usually we feature, you know, in a typical uh, virtual tasting, four different bottles from around the world, um, there'll always be a Spanish one. And when we get to Spain, no matter what region I'm talking about, I say Spain represents some of the most amazing value on the planet. And we're not serving cheap wines at these tastings. We're serving $30, $40, $50 bottles. And those $40 bottles of Spanish wine would be double the price if they had a better address. And I always say this, Americans, we talk about wine by the grapes in the old world where all of those grapes come from. Um, they talk about them by address. So two addresses tonight, Ribera and Rueda, um, just two of hundreds you'd have to figure out as you navigate your way through the, uh, the wine aisles in your uh, favorite wine shop or online in the store. But what that translates to is you're not always going to get the grape on the label. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. It's more often the address. And Spain has quite a few unknown addresses for Americans. We're not used to talking about Spanish wines as much as we talk about Spanish, uh, Italian and French. Um, so this is a great opportunity to learn about Spain. And I really mean this. In the Northeast where I live, um, some of the greatest values on, in, in every wine shop I go into could be $10, $12, $15 bottles of Spanish wine that are only that price because nobody knows what they are. And if they knew that, they would probably pay double that or at least five or ten dollars more for that. And that's just that's the bargains are waiting right out there for you. We're starting with these four tonight that, again, they're not bargains. But if they had more famous addresses like Bordeaux or Burgundy, they might be 10, 15, 20 dollars more than they are. So let's let's enjoy this before Brady conquers the world with uh, Drink Real Spain and the prices start to fly as the wines become more popular um, early in my career. Uh, I landed an amazing job working for wines from Spain which is the commercial trade arm of the Spanish government that represents all wines from Spain. And they had this campaign in the mid nineties. Uh, my job was to take four bottles uh, to, of wine to restaurants all over New York city and teach waiters and bartenders how to talk about Spanish wines so they could sell more to their customers. So it was a win-win for, you know, for the Spanish government and, and for the restaurants to sell more wine and, and they weren't very expensive and they could, they could mark them up however they wanted. But this is where I came to understand how to talk about wines with uh, you know, my, fellow New Yorkers, fellow winemakers, fellow Americans about the difference between old world and new world, how we talk by the grape and how they over there talk about regions more than grapes. And it makes the confusion um, is real. And uh, those waiters and bartenders 25 years ago um, had to had to uh, learn uh, very quickly how to talk about these wines to turn Americans onto them um, so that you know they could talk about them with the fluidity as if they were from uh, more familiar addresses. Um, that made my job really challenging but fast forward 
25 years later, there are hundreds and hundreds of Spanish wines now available on wine lists and in wine shops all over the country. So to the point, the address is tonight. Um, we are going to Castilla e Leon, the land of castles and lions. And um, the official flag for this region is in north central Spain, about two hours north of Madrid, bears images of castles and lions, uh, a coat of arms commissioned by leaders several centuries ago. But the presence of many castles scattered throughout the region and architectural symbols of the watchful eye of the lion persist today. Um, that symbolism does not just represent the name of um, an expansive region, but also a sense of purpose. So tonight, um, I'd like to explore with you um, the uh, those storied lions and castles, how they've come to represent two of Spain's greatest wine regions, Ribera and Rueda. Um, this explains why Rueda was the place where the first white grape in Spain was bestowed with the designation Denominación de Origen, or the D.O., um, and you'll see that language a lot on wines, where you, especially on Spanish wines, which is one of the best gifts for American consumers. You turn a bottle around, and by law, they give you very important information about the DO, where it's from, and maybe what age level it is. We'll talk about that too as we go. Um, but uh, the government uh, bestowed the Rueda region, the first DO, uh, a sort of government seal of approval that a wine bearing that name, Rueda Verdejo, may only be made within the designated geographic region or the do so this is this exists all over europe and in, in the new world it's not so clear and clear cut but in in uh, in spain specifically the do if there's a do uh, on the label it means there are very specific rules how it's allowed to be produced where it's allowed to be grown and how much you know they're how much they might have to age it and what grapes are allowed to be used in what percentages it's very very technical but you could google any of that stuff if you really wanted to go deep um there's a ton of stuff a ton of information at drink real spain um, that you could find uh, that that uh, the great team that, that Brady's working with has written. Um, by the way, I want to give a shout out to Cheese Lady, Laura Whirlin. Uh, that was her voice when the, the video opened up uh, with talking about cheeses. Um, Laura is a great friend and a cheese expert. Um, her Instagram handle is at Cheese Lady with a Z, C H E E Z E L E D Y. And she, uh, she has taken a deep dive with Brady on uh, this region, having gone twice with him to the region uh, to discover the, the food and the local flavor. So I'm going to lean heavily on her pairings later. Um, but let's talk about this prestigious destination, Rueda Verdejo. And um, at the heart, Rueda and its signature grape, Verdejo, is all about agriculture. So I want you to grab, grab this bottle here. We're going to start with um, the Marquez de Irún, just, uh, just letting you know where we're starting. Um, winemakers here get to decide the style of Verdejo where that, that, that best represents their grapes, the particular terroir, and themselves. Indeed, with Verdejo, you're not just tasting wine, you're tasting the entire region. It's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 I mean, it's the essence of terroir. It's everything about the place, everything that goes into it from the altitude, from the, the, the humidity, the soil, the, the, the weather factors, temperatures, uh, diurnal shifts from day to night, all that goes in. It's an expression of climate, of the high altitude at which Verdejo works so hard to grow, a grape and region that even the government recognizes as special and a place where the monks set the stage a thousand years ago to put something great and delicious into the glass today. Um, that's the great story of a lot of great old wine regions in, in, in Europe in general that monks planted on behalf of the church and, and really figured out what grew best where. And we benefit from all of that um, today uh, as we do with this region of Spain. So let's talk about Verdejo, the world's next great wine. Um, according to my friends at, at Drink Real Spain, ask any Spaniard, and this is true, they will tell you their favorite Spanish white wine and you ask them, I'm sorry, if you ask them for their favorite Spanish wine, it's a good chance that they will answer Verdejo. As Spain's number one selling white wine, Verdejo's popularity <laughs> is, excuse me, undeniable. Um, ask some of the world's most famous winemakers inside and outside of Spain to name their favorite Spanish white wine. And the answer is likely going to be the same, Verdejo. Um, it's shocking. I've done it. And I ask, I ask winemakers what they're excited about. And they say, you know, Spanish Verdejo is really on fire. And it is. Winemakers from other parts of Europe as well as well as within Spain see Verdejo as a huge, having huge potential. And as a result, these wines have been quietly putting down roots, literally, for the past four decades in Rueda, Verdejo's primary growing region. So despite the fact that the grape was brought to the area from North Africa 10 centuries ago, um, it's still nothing short of a miracle that renewed winemakers, renowned winemakers have uh, been drawn to the area. The climate in Rueda located in the northeast, uh, the northwest of Castilla Leon is, to put it mildly, harsh, super harsh. Gra grapes have to work really, really hard to grow here. 
Um, the rocky soils seem as if they would be inhospitable to, to almost anything living. And the desert-like landscape is not typical postcard wine country for my friends in California who are spoiled rotten with beautiful verdant roads and hills and valleys. Uh, this literally looks like a moonscape. It's crazy how, how uh, rough the soil is there. So the grapes have to try really hard to get down and find the water table um, and survive uh, the punishing temperature uh, shifts and the cold and the wind. Um, yet for just those exact reasons, Verdejo thrives and it is still thriving. Uh, winemakers are taking what was mostly considered a simple wine and are turning it into a, into, as Brady likes to call it, head turning juice. That's how the cool Psalms talk about wine, by the way, if you want to sound cool, just call it juice instead of wine. And this is head turning juice. Um, they've discovered that the hard dirt, pebbles, sandy clay soils, hot temperatures, high altitude, 2,000 to 2,500 feet, by the way, we're pretty high up and frigid, frigid winters conspire to produce a grape whose concentrated flavors translate to wine that is equally at home at summertime picnics as at Michelin starred restaurants. So why you are wondering why? Because some of our way to wine producers are kicking it up a notch by employing winemaking techniques used by some of the finest whites from Champagne and Burgundy. In the process, they're not only producing sensational sparkling Verdejos, but also age-worthy still wines as well. So when we talk about still wines, just for those who are who are, don't understand wine, wine parlance, still is anything that doesn't bubble. Verdejo can be made in both sparkling styles and still styles. Part of the reason is because these winemakers are utilizing lees aging um, to bring complexity and texture to the wine. Lees is uh, the, the leftover skins uh, after fermentation. Normally a wine winemaker might take them right away, drain the wine off and, and put them in barrel or in, in, in steel. Um, these are left in small wooden vats called foudras uh, to let the wine sit on the lees and oak you know, for, for uh, uh, it's well suited to oak aging. And it's, it's something that a lot of winemakers are, are dabbling with. We're going to taste one that has a little bit of oak aging and you'll, you'll be shocked at how rich and different it is from the first one. Um, flavor development and mouthfeel comes from winemakers are, are using concrete eggs for aging as well. So um, some are using just complete steel, clean eggs, concrete eggs, and then some are putting them in oak. So the, the styles are all over the place. As a result, these wines can be laid down for years. All to say, Rueda Verdejo is slowly but surely turning into world-class wine. That has a reputation for richness, herbal notes, complexity, minerality, and aging potential of five to 10 years. And if you're not a big white wine lover, you need to know that uh, typically, honestly, and this is a true answer, people say, how long should I hold on to this white wine? Um, the typical answer is most white wines, most everyday drinking wines, five years, literally five years. And, and you know, you probably get rid of it unless you're talking about something like a, you know, Bordeaux Blanc or a Sancerre, something really high quality. Um, I'd like to say that now that I'm familiar with these wines and I've been tasting a lot of them in the last two years, um, I would say that uh, these are world-class wines that can age alongside the greatest Sauvignon Blancs on the planet, like Sancerre. Uh, from the Loire and Bordeaux Blanc in the hands of the right winemakers. So age and complexity um, with process and bottle age is, is how we are talking about these beautiful Verdejos now. When done right, um, the, the varietal will gain weight in the body. Um, aromas warm up and creaminess can result. That means they go with a wide range of foods. And I'm going to talk about them in a second. But in the younger styles, the white wines of Verdejo are graceful and majestic and soft like the lioness that we like to use as our metaphor. Um, that's the Verdejo grape in a nutshell, graceful, balanced, and stealthy. So let me talk about styles really quickly. Um, you might see on the back of a label, the word Hoven with a J. It's a young, I um, like to say patio style, porch pounder, lively acidity, easy drinker, everyday sipper. Um, then there's Lee's aged. And this is all about texture and cream beginning to develop. And you'll, you'll see it, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see as we go. A little bit of lees aging can really change the texture and bring a real creaminess to it, but it doesn't taste oaky. It doesn't taste like what, what turns off a lot of people about, you know, for example, um, American Chardonnay uh, in the past that made people say, oh, they're all oaky, they're all toasty. Not true. Um, oak rested, typically on lees. So these are even more developed with textures of creaminess and really big body weight. So we'll talk about that body weight when we taste the wines. Um, and we're going to do that in one second. Um, again, lookalike regions, Sancerre from the Loire Valley, Bordeaux Blanc, even Chablis, which is you know the famous oak-free Chardonnay birthplace in Burgundy. So if you uh, if you're a fan of Chablis, you will love this wine. But there's only one way to tell if you're going to love it, and I'm going to say grab this bottle. So let's grab the Marquez de Rune, um, and open it up. I'm going to pour myself a little splash here. Okay, so let's talk about really quickly. Um, 
aroma first. If you give this a little swirl, put your big Italian nose in the glass. What do you smell? Lovely, lovely fruit and minerality, crisp, dry, citrus. I mean, if I was thinking of like how we would, uh, this is, you know, try not to be too Sami and geeky here, but we would call these the star fruit aromas, which are not star fruit. It's if you cut an apple through the, uh, the equator and look at the fruit, when you open it, there's a star pattern. So pears, apples, the dry, crispy um, fruits, not the opposite, which would be the stone fruits, the big, luscious, what uh, my friend Andrea Robinson calls the shirt staining summer fruits of, of some wines that you could taste in really big, full bodied, creamy, rich wines. On the nose, I smell zero oak, so very, very clean. And let's taste it. But I want to ask you to taste. This is a, a little, a little, uh, a little public service announcement from uh, how I conduct tastings. I know it's completely unorthodox, and I know people think it's you know uh, they just want to get the party started and drink. I have a theory, and I stand firm on it. The first sip of any wine does not count. Pause. Whatever's on your palate before this will affect the balance of the wine. Maybe not kill it but it could make it taste really, really dry. If you just brushed your teeth like me, or you had a coffee, or if you like Brady have been pre-gaming for an hour or two, it's on the palate, it just changes. It just changes everything. So let's call this the first sip. We're gonna call it, in my office, we call it the rinse, but in polite company, we're gonna call it a toast. So let's make a toast to Rivera and Rueda. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Take a first sip and don't even think about it. Okay. What am I thinking about? Don't think, just think about how happy you are to the second sip is right now, Brady. Here's what I want you to do though. Take the second sip. Don't swallow right away. I'm going to swish it all around. When I give you the down the hatch, swallow and pay attention to what happens. It's very, very cool. Cheers, everybody. Second sip is called the balance. Okay, down it goes. There's the fruit. You see that beautiful balance we have now? You can actually feel waves and waves of fruit and acid. You actually feel from the square of your jawline, the tide rises in that gutter between your teeth and lower gums, and the tide rises over your teeth. This is beautiful acid in play. Acid will always win the battle with fruit, but it's going to keep making waves of salivate, dissipate, salivate, dissipate. And this is in every single wine you've ever had, but most, most of us aren't paying attention to that. We're just drinking and having fun. I look for it to say this. You've tasted it now clean. Do you like this wine? Would you drink this wine? Um, and you need to understand one very important fact before you make a decision. Um, if you like this wine, congratulations, you have great taste like me and Brady. But if you're not sure and you're honest about it, and you're like, mm, I don't know, I'm more of a red wine person or I'm more of a whatever person, I would say you must add food. Food changes everything. So I hope you, I hope you set something out, some beautiful cheeses, some beautiful crackers. Um, but I also want to say this too. Um, if you don't like these wines, any of these tonight, um, I need to say very clearly that I could not care less. And what does that mean? I'm not here to judge your palate. I can't tell you what to like. I can only lead the horse to water and say, drink. The truth is this. Um, we have uh, four beautiful wines uh, that uh, Brady curated for us with Verve uh, directly. We put them together. We show you them. And I say, please try each wine three times. So if you haven't yet, let's try a little bite of something. I have some crispy, cheesy crackers. And then we'll take a third sip. All bets are off. It's going to change and get even better. Cheers, everybody. Okay. Now think about where the, remember the flood that was coming in from the gum line here? Gone. Where is it now? All of the juice is under your tongue, and it's pooling around and around and around. The acid found what the acid wanted. A little bit of fat changes everything. And I say this in every tasting. A little fat. If you didn't get it, if, if I see somebody getting up to get some food, guys, grab anything. Even a potato chip will do the job. Uh, a teaspoon of peanut butter, a little fat, a little salt. Everything changes and the wine just gets bigger and better. Um, so to me, uh, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous, uh, super, super uh, dry style. Um, but Brady, I want to ask if you want to uh, chip into any uh, any comments about this wine or anything. If, if, if you have any, anything you want to say about this style of 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 uh of wine uh this is a great <laughs> um you know i kind of throw out this idea of this thing called the concert dilemma and the concert dilemma is when you're at a concert with a bunch of people and the person next to you is drinking a specific wine and that wine the whole time 
starts to emulate a flavor or a profile that's not honest or appealing to you as your as a neighbor that to me is like called whininess and this wine to be honest it, it borders on that a little bit but it's still really fresh and delicious so i'm looking for that balance between when does something give me that kind of like whiny exhaustion flavor and when does somebody keep me in fresh and the appealing moment so that's what i'm tasting once i really start to acclimate my palate to this and wash away everything else sorrows toothpaste and you know the need to drink so that's where i'm at all right i like it i like it um i'd love to hear from anybody uh Brittany, if anyone's asking any questions or has uh has uh any comments we'd love to hear it from you please don't be shy um and uh let us know what you're thinking no questions yet nothing but yet. i am monitoring chat so pop those in there friends okay. uh just very quickly uh, marquez de Aru is a small bodega owned uh, by a family a famed sherry house, Emilio Lustau. The vineyards are located near La Seca, um, in the uh, in the heart of the Rueda Do. The Verdejo varietal grown in these vineyards has extraordinary um, charm and complexity. Just as in Jerez, the philosophy here is quality and value. The small bodega is equipped with really, really all the latest technology: stainless steel vats, cooling system, pneumatic presses, everything to uh, to extract the ultimate uh, expression of of this wine uh, for uh, for a fraction of of what a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of other uh, I've spent Spanish wines I've seen rising crazier and crazier. So I think it's a it's a really delicious style here. Um, I'd love to hear from you though if you have any questions. If not, I'm question gonna... Anthony was uh, from Lexi. She threw out, "Is this wine got some lees contact or some rest?" Um, I no, not that I know of. This is just this is a fresh, clean, uh, uh, Hoven style. Uh, no lees at all. Um, so it's, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's like the ultimate clean expression of, of, uh, of, of this, of this wine. I think it's really, really beautiful. Um, I've got one more also from Stephanie. What is it good to pair with? Oh, that's, that's fun. I, I, have, I have a lot to <laughs> say about that when we're done. Let's talk about food pairing. Um, why don't we do this? Why don't we um, taste the second one, uh, now, and then we'll talk about pairing with both of them because there's, uh, Laura has given me a ton of great information to share with you. So um, I want you to grab the Nesia right here. Mine is a little shiny from the ice bucket. Um, La Suertes Rueda. Okay, guys, let's smell. How, how does this differ from the last one? much much creamier richer definitely a little oak here so this is a definitely a style that's had some some um some oak uh, contact 12 months uh surly and french oak punctions um let's taste it knowing the first sip does not count cheers everybody down it goes now, because this wine is so much bigger and more complex than the last one, um, it actually tastes pretty good on that first sip. But I'm guaranteeing you, and this is where I want you to pay attention to how this works. Honestly, if you like it already, you're going to die when you taste it the second time on a clean palate. It's going to be so much better. Let's taste that second sip for balance. Cheers. Okay, down it goes. Okay, so here we have um, a very, very uh, beautiful uh, a wine that I think, and Brady and I were talking about this yesterday, this wine, we like to say it punches above its weight class. It's, uh, it's definitely a Lees plus Oak style. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's 12 months uh, in French Oak punchins uh, made by Bodegas Ordonez. So if you don't know Ordonez, it's uh, one of the, the pre premier, premier Spanish wine families in Spain, all over the place, by the way. Um, you'll find Jorge Adonis's name on the back of a lot of bottles, but this uh, this uh, this Verdejo is planted in southeastern subzone of Dio Rueda, um, the only part of the Appalachian that completely resisted phylloxera. Um, if you don't know phylloxera, you're going to Google this: P H Y L O X E R double L O X E R A. It is a gift that the uh, Americans, the United States, sent to uh, to, to Europe 
in the uh, 1850s when we were all sharing vines uh, and, and vine cuttings to, uh, to, to share you know, all of our culture and our grapes. Um, we sent uh, Europe our, our, our uh, Concord grapes. Uh, they sent us their beautiful, they sent us their beautiful, uh, their beautiful vines, and we sent a microscopic root louse called phylloxera that wound up ruining almost the entire continent of of Europe uh, over the next eighty years. And uh, this little subzone here is resistant to phylloxera due to the sandy quality of the soils. The 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 the, the bugger could not make uh, its way through this region. So this has produced an authentic Verdeo in the old fashioned way, working with traditional vineyard sites, using old school winemaking techniques and um, a little bit of oak barrel. So this is, again, this is, this, this is a highlight of that bigger, um, more leaves plus oak style, more texture, really, really pretty. Um, any, any thoughts on this? Anybody? Brady, do you want to say anything about this, this, this style of wine or anything in general about this leasy, oaky style that's really changing uh, the perception of Rueda? Yeah, I mean, this is a Jorge Adornio's product. And as we know that he touches a lot of really cool things that's happened around Spain. Um, he's very forward, but traditional thinker in the way it comes to production and wines and also the way that things are farmed properly. So his projects are usually good stewardship of earth, land and grape. This bottle itself has this like aged lees ability to take on a little bit of age statement, which is really important and kind of really cool for like what's happening in the region. So this is one of the kind of starlight boats for what can happen if you take this bottle, which is 2018 put it down for four more years, you've got something very special. Um, as an 18, I mean, we're current release is 2020 right now. So this is still three years old um, by vintage, possibly four. So this is what happens when wines pick a little bit of weight up um, in time and in process. So sexy package across the board. I mean, I just love the bottle. Um, it's, it's gorgeous. And then to answer a question back to Lexi's question about the lees on the Arun, there was between three and four months um, lees in stainless on that last wine. So, um, and what's interesting because the next next month we've got the Arun in a 2018 statement. So uh, we're taking 20 right now. Next tasting next month, we're gonna see an 18 of this, which really in a screw cap starts to show some age statement. So. Uh, just a little tidbit there. Brady, while you're going, Richard had a question too about the price points of both Verdejos. They're free. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is it all good wine free? Um, Richard, good question. So I think you're going to find the Arun around... 15 bucks a bottle, which is pretty strong. And if you put this in a 2020 version down in your cellar and forget about it for two years, God bless you. It's going to pick up color, weight, age, and structure and get your little wine geeky friends all in a fucking titty. And it's going to be beautiful and stressy and it's got a lot of tension on it. The Nisea is old vines, beautiful. That should be punching around $32, $36 a bottle, but it's coming out the marketplace at like $24, $28. And I think it's well underneath what it's really worth. So yep. buy a six pack of this. This comes in OWC, which is original wood case, wrapped individually in bottle. That is the best six pack coming out of Rueda right now. So... So. Congrats to Jorge and team. <laughs> and Brady, that, that goes back to what I said. Um, like, you know, this should be 36 bucks and it's coming out in like 24, 25. And it has everything to do with the wines are not as well known among like, you know, the general public as they are among wine dorks like us. And that keeps the prices down for now. But I guarantee you, we have this, we have this tasting again in five years, the prices are going to be up. So this might be a good time to start investing in some of these. And they age. So why not? You could do that. Um, I want to talk about food pairing. 
Um, I want to thank um, again Laura Worland uh, at at Cheese Lady on Instagram. If, uh, if I know she's not with us tonight, but um, for Verdejo, consider lighter fare with lively acidity, herbs, smooth finishes. The tasting profile for the wines can range from elegant and graceful wines that are aromatic with citrus, stone fruit, lively acidity, and white peach. Uh, with a bit more bottle aging, the young wines gain weight and body and develop the texture. As the leaves and oak are more involved in the process, the wines inhibit more creaminess and depth. We've talked about this, and you can see the difference between one and two. Um, the spice box complementing Verdejo includes highly aromatic herbs, perfumed, sharp citrus-like spices, um, Thai basil, turmeric, dill, coriander, um, you name it. But for starters, uh, why not like lightly dressed, bright, tangy salads, seafood tapas, conservas, meaty olives, raw fish, crudos, pokey, ceviche, um, seafood, grilled sardines. I mean, you're going to find if you go to Spain, sardines are like the, the national fish on every tapas bar. Um, Maine's seafood paella. I had a really great paella last night at uh, Casa Dani, um, where the, the shrimp uh, the shrimp paella was amazing. It was actually the mariscos pa paella. Um, that would have been perfect with this wine, but I didn't have it with me. Um, desserts, cheese courses. I prefer cheese courses instead of desserts always, but um, let's talk about cheeses really quickly. Uh, Laura gave us uh, Hoven Verdejo would want a young, uh, you'd want a Cypress Grove Humboldt Farg or a fresh Chevra or a Miti Caña Caña de Cabra. Uh, from Spain. So like, because those are wines are such <coughs> fresh, crispy styles, they pair with mild, creamy cheeses. Um, Lee's aged Verdejos, like uh, the first one, um, slightly Lee's aged, medium textures and cream, uh, la, you know, lead to uh, maybe a Manchego, Calgo Creamery Mount Tam, one of my favorite American styles, or a, a, a beautiful mushroomy flavored cheese like Monte Enebro uh, or Leonora. Um, and then the oak rested Lee's style, like the last wine, the, uh, the, the second white, um, these wines are, you know, definitely more developed with uh, rustic, uh, nutty aromas uh, and flavors. You want to look for like a 12-month Manchego, a Roncal, or a Roth Grand Cru Deserve, uh, Reserve. So a lot to think about. Um, I have simple Parmigiano-Reggiano crackers <laughs> that my wife gave me, and they're actually really great, especially, especially, especially with the Nicaea. It really pops, um, really pops beautifully. Um, any comments, any thoughts? Before we move on, I want to head to Ribera now and talk about Red wines. We're, we're just past the halfway mark here. All right, let's talk about Ribera, land of extremes, home of the king, Tempranillo. Um, if you know anything about Spanish wine, um, you know that Tempranillo plays a huge role throughout the country, and it tastes different everywhere. Um, Brady and I were talking about this. Uh, we've talked about it many times about how Tempranillo tastes so different from areas that could be very close nearby, um, and is, is there a problem with the transmission right now? I think so. Okay, sorry. everybody just disappeared. I'm, all the squares disappeared. I thought we lost. <laughs> sorry, guys. All right, um, let's talk about uh, Spain is to talk about a complex past. As with most countries that have been around for thousands of years, Spain has a storied history. Castilla Leon plays a significant role in that uh, history. Um, the Romans ruled the country before the fall of the Roman Empire. Then the Moors came in, Muslims from North Africa, moved in and were mostly in control for a few hundred years, but their Islamic beliefs were at odds with the Christianity of the ruling kings and conflict followed. Not until the 15th century could Spaniards claim Spain as their own once and for all. And to this end, the castles of the region served a very real purpose to defend against any would-be invaders. Um, and there's still today, you can see gorgeous, gorgeous castles throughout the area. Today, they lend architectural beauty to the landscape, attract visitors the world over. But a particular note, uh, Peña Fiel, a castle in Valladolid, uh, sorry, Valladolid province uh, of, uh, of Ribera del Duero is one of four wine growing regions in the area. The impressive fortress is 650 feet long. Uh, wine, of course, is part of the history here too, having been produced for well over 2,000 years here. It took a few hundred more years before relatively advanced winemaking techniques would be introduced by the Benedictine monks in the 12th century. I talked about those monks earlier. They are very, very uh, industrious uh, cultivators of, of vineyards um, throughout Europe, starting with the Roman Empire and all the way uh, to the, you know, the Atlantic and Portugal, um, planted all over the place. Uh, what, uh, what those uh, developed, what, what they planted in the 12th century uh, ultimately set the stage for Ribeiro do Duero to gain denomination de origin or the DO in 1982. So what has followed is a reputation as one of the great, great, great wine regions of Spain or wine regions of the world. Um, and it all begins with Tempranillo, um, a regal grape. For good reason, 
Tinto Fino, a.k.a. Tempranillo, remains the king of Ribera del Duero. So just to clear up any confusion, in this area, they actually call it Tinto Fino. It's just an a.k.a. for Tempranillo. You know, it, it takes on many names in Spain. But unlike other Tempranillos, Tinto Fino is darker, a more tannic version of its counterparts. Don't forget, this area we told you is, is really, really harsh growing conditions. Um, these, these grapes work a lot harder than they have to in some uh, better growing areas of Spain, but these, you know, the, the effort pays off in what they, what they yield. Also, because many of Ribera del Duero vines have been around for decades, they've managed to adapt to short growing seasons that develop their fruit relatively quickly. Um, in fact, there's a really funny phrase I learned when, um, when I was there years ago, uh, that there are basically, um, their seasons are 10 months of winter and two months of hell. So that's basically a year in a nutshell there. So the grapes really have a very quick summer and it's it's hellishly, hellishly hot. And the rest of the month is when the rest of the year is winter. So it's pretty funny. Um, the result is complex wines, balanced acidity, a backbone of tannins, dark fruit, sturdy structure. Um, here the grapes are from different plots are typically handpicked, fermented separately. So winemakers control the process, understand the best way to make wine from each parcel. Um, with organic viticulture becoming increasingly popular throughout the wine world, many growers in the region have always farmed organically. So it's sort of like the big Spanish shrug, like, yeah, we've been doing it forever. What took everyone else so long? In Ribera del Duero, sustainability is not a trend, it's a tradition. So I love, love, love that. And I, I learned that over 25 years ago when I first went to Spain. Um, this is not just part of what lends Ribera del Duero wines its reputation. Um, Spain's most expensive wines come from this region. See? Vega Sicilia and Pingus, to name just a few. Um, and it's because of that, the bar is set really, really high for producers of all levels to create exceptional wines with equally exceptional value. So this translates to wines that can be equally at home on the everyday table as they are on the most exclusive ones. And when you have a wine region that is as challenging to grow grapes as Roberto Duero, the dedication by winemakers to make wines at all levels is, by definition, focused and intense, just like their wines. So perhaps paradoxic, paradoxically, that intensity translates to wines that offer finesse, elegance, and luxuriousness. And it sounds crazy, but it's true. All this comes at a fraction of the price compared to other super premium wines from the world-renowned regions like Napa, Bordeaux, Burgundy, and Piedmont. Roberto Duero wines can go head-to-head -head with the wines from any of those regions. But fortunately for Ribera lovers, the competition stops at price. Some uh, Same superior wine level at a lower price. We are all winning with Ribera del Duero, unless it's Vegas Sicilia and Pingus, of course. But um, I'll send you my uh, I'll send you my birthday, everybody. And you could you could uh, send me a bottle when uh, when when uh, when that comes around next February. Today, Ribera is home to more than three hundred wineries, twenty three hundred brands, all of which have an almost singular focus: Tempranillo. So let's really quickly before we taste these two wines, let's talk about styles. We talked about it with the whites, and we talked about it with the reds. Within the DO of Ribera del Duero, production and labeling is regulated into four main aging categories. The youngest is Hoven, again, same as before with the with the um, Rueda, which is to spend little or no time aging in the, at the winery, less than a year in barrel, if any time at all. Then there is Crianza, and if you speak Spanish, um, its root is in, in newborn, um, aged for at least 12 months in barrel, but that's it. They come right out onto the market. Reserva, three years of aging with at least 12 months in oak and two years in bottle prior to release. And then there's Grand Reserva, a wine matured for five years or more at the winery with at least 24 months in barrel at a minimum, sometimes longer, and the rest of the time in bottle. This is typically done only in exceptional vintages during great harvest. Um, guys, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. Unlike most countries on the planet where wine is a business, where you make it, you bottle it and you sell it, get it out of the way, get it out and make room for the next vintage. Spain holds onto the wine until the winemaker deems it is ready. So sure, there's these age, you know, these age restrictions, like minimum of five years for a Grand Reserva, but you can go to wine shops to tomorrow and look for, look at the Spanish section, look at the, turn the bottles around, look at, look at all the different classifications. Grand Reservas on the, on retail shelves right now, are from the mid 2000s. So you'll feel, you'll find 2012, 2013, 14, and you'll think, God, these must be sitting here a long time. No, the winemaker just released them because they are just ready now. It is, it goes against every tenet of, of capitalism. They hold on to the wine at great expense and storage, and they hold on to them until they're ready. And they say, okay, now it's ready, drink it. So you don't take them home and hold them for another 10 years. You drink it and enjoy it and, and get on with the party. Lastly is the wild card. Uh, classification called cosecha and the wild card of the region is uh, uh, uh what what uh brady has explained to me as authorship and it's the winemaker doesn't want to 
get into the Crianza Reserva Grand Reserva um, game of aging requirements and restrictions. And they say, you know what, we're going to call it cosecha. So it sort of pulls us out of um, the strict rules of aging, but they can still do whatever they want as long as it's, it's following specific uh, rules. But it's, it's definitely an authorship. They want to decide when it's ready, not the consortium and any label age or bottle age, but you have to do your homework to figure out these wines. So like cosecha doesn't mean, oh, this is made by some amazing artist and it's going to be great. Look, you, you should have to do some homework for them. But when you see cosecha, it means, okay, so they stepped out of the rules. Why? What's the story here? Um, we're going to taste two of them right now that are cosecha and they are delicious. So um, really quickly, I've talked about lookalike regions and I think this is really important for people who drink other wines and don't know Spanish wine so well. If you like Bordeaux, meaning if you like Cabernet and Merlot, if you like blends, um, Cabernet Franc, you will like Tempranillo, you will like this Ribera del Duero. If you like Burgundy, if you like Pinot Noir, um, so this would be at the more powerful end of the spectrum because they can be they can be elegant and light, but they have more power. But there's, you know, we would say there's a kinship with Burgundy and Piedmont, which I like to think straddles um, both Burgundy and Bordeaux because Piedmont is like Nebbiolo grape, which is really, really uh, the love child of Cabernet and Pinot Noir, if there ever was one where it's got beautiful, great acidity and fruit, but the wines are powerful and they last and they're very tannic and they're really light. They tr totally trick you in color. They're super, super light on, on uh, in the glass. And you think, oh, this must be a really light, uh, you know, a light wine. And then you taste it like, oh, there's the power. Um, Napa Valley Cabernets have a lot in common with this area too, because it's, uh, it's, it's the power we're talking about. So let's taste Ribera Tempranillo. I want you to grab the first bottle, which is the Goyo. Um, so here it is right here. Um, grab the Goyo. And um, let's taste it first, then we'll talk about it. But um, just like before. Goyo Garcia. Talk about it, Brady. Let's hear it. Goyo, man. Like this is uh this is the benchmark of stewardship. You know, if you're going to have a vineyard project or, you know, 13 or 14 different vineyard projects and you want to make sure that you only squeeze what you can out of the earth in a respectful way and only make wines to represent those places, this is your winemaker. Um, you know, there's a lot of really unique things about this wine, which I'll let Anthony dive into, but the producer, this is just this is uh, representing the style of what we call Cosecha and the new world of what's mm -hmm. happening in Ribeiro de Duero. Fantastic. Um, so let's taste it and then we'll talk about it. But right off on the right off the bat on the nose, what do you smell? Anybody want to throw something out there? If you're on the Zoom, you could you could pipe in. But to me, earthy, funky, black fruit. A little bit of that 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 uh, that feral quality that we like. A little bit of uh, like I, I remember a, a, who was it? A Spanish winemaker on um, Mallorca told it. He called it animal, where it's like it's that that really really interesting, wild, untamed uh, aroma of of not just fruit, but a little bit of animal happening there. Smells like a wine rave. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes at four o'clock in the morning Woo. is that the kind of animal you're looking for yeah a lot of there's been a lot of day and if it's a spanish wine party we've been dancing for hours and we're not done until about 10 a.m so yeah and definitely one of the sponsors is not uh <laughs> a deodorant company <laughs> lay animal all right let's uh let's let's taste this first except knowing it does not count Okay, even on the first sip, the balance from the last wine is still there. So you're, it's very, very chalky and dry. I want you to remember this because think about how many times in your life you have tasted one sip of a wine and said, oh, no, no, thank you. Remember the old days when we sipped out of each other's glasses pre-COVID? You're sipping whatever you're drinking and a friend walks over and says, hey, taste this, you're gonna love it. And you go, okay, great. And you're tasting like, nah, not really. Not, not really what I'm into. You cannot judge on the first sip. So everybody, do the work. Let's get in there for the second sip. It's called research, everybody. You have to do it. Okay, down it goes. Power, tannin. But let's talk about where the juice is. So four elements of red wine. The fruit and acid that we talked about in the whites, I call the party downstairs. It's where all those waves of fruit and acid keep rising, dissipating, rising and dissipating. But fruit and acid, 
are met by tannin and alcohol. If you chilled these reds as you should, and I could go on a rant that would take us another half an hour, all I'm going to say is this. I expect there's some really good wine people on this call, and, and there's some people who maybe just joined along for the fun. Um, whatever your wine uh, prowess, I don't want to hear from anybody ever that red wine should be served at room temperature ever again. This is misinformation. This has been a, it's like the, the game of telephone where somebody whispered this down the lane 100 years ago, and we're still talking about it. And it's the dumbest thing ever. What is room temperature? Where do you live? Uh, my room temperature in New York is not the same as yours in Alabama or yours in California. There's no such thing as room temperature. Um, all red wine needs to be between 55 and 65. 65 is the high end. Some reds, like beautiful, crisp, clean, um, light, 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 super high acid reds like Gamay's and Pinot Noir's could be actually left in the ice bucket with the champagne in the middle of summer. If you're drinking outside, it will not get too cold. It will warm up quickly, but it, it can handle it because of the acidity. They're red. They're actually white wines in the sky, some of those reds. Um, here, we're at the other end of the spectrum. These are tannic. They're very chalky. Do you feel it across the roof of your mouth? That's the fourth element. The tannin is what's drying you out, and that's in all red wine thanks to skin contact. And if that's if it's, it's not clear, I want you to think about if you went to your kitchen fridge and grabbed red grapes, squeeze them over a paper napkin, what color is the juice? It is clear. It is not rosé. It is not a little red. It's not pink. It is completely clear because all wine is born red until skin touches juice. And once it does, tannin enters the equation. Tannin is a puckery, bitter preservative that mellows with time. The Spaniards, they actually let the wines mellow for you. So when they're letting them mellow for you, um, when you by the time you have them, they could be a lot less tannic, but they still need food to break through tannin. How do you break through tannin? Age, air, food. If you're like me, you're not really aging a lot of stuff. You're drinking it when you get it. And you have to, you know, you have to add a little air. Here's aerating. You do not need a $60 aerator gizmo in your bottle. This is called aerating right here. Or you could pour it from one bottle to a container, back into the bottle, to a container, taste it. It will soften and open and it'll be ready in no time. But this wine definitely has some tan in here. So let's taste it one more time to see. And then we'll take it from there. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> Okay, tannins are softening because my palate's getting used to it. I'm gonna add a little cheese. Let's grab it if you have some cheese, some crackers. I wanna tell you a little bit about um, the Goyo Garcia. So you've had it now three sips, maybe more. I see some of you um, are really, really digging in there and I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, you, uh, if, if you were to vote on this, I would hope you like this wine. But again, I can't, I can't make you like it. I can only tell you that if you do like it, congratulations, you have great taste like me. But if not, um, there's, there's a world of wine out there for you. But try it not only tonight with different foods. If you don't finish this bottle tonight, put the cork in, put it in the fridge. It's food. You want to preserve it overnight. Take it out tomorrow. Let it warm up a little bit and start your breakfast of champions with some beautiful huevos rancheros and some beautiful wine and see what happens. I'm not kidding guys, taste these throughout the day with different foods. You can't believe where you might find an amazing pairing just waiting and waiting to be, to be discovered. Uh, but uh, this wine, uh, 80 year old vines at uh, the Goyo Farms, uh, small plots in the Roberto del Duero, each different altitudes and on different types of soil. Um, all the vineyards have been uh, planted with red and white grapes. Um, which uh, sometimes he co-ferments using natural methods as winemakers did in the older days of Ribera del Duero winemaking. Um, all the grapes are distemmed. Um, the method has become what is a trend for many contemporary winemakers, but for Goyo it has been the way they've been making wine um, since the 1980s. He used traditional winemaking methods in order to express a flavor and profile. And I think this wine is absolutely beautiful, but um, I'd love to hear if you have any, any thoughts on it at all. Let's, let's talk about it. Anybody? What are the uh, grapes in this one? You got it? I'm sorry? What are the grapes? It's a single vineyard Tempranillo. We talked about that already. I oh, got it. Sorry. Yeah. They were trying to trick me there. <laughs> um, it's an organic single vineyard Tempranillo cultivated uh, at high elevations, uh, hand harvested, destemmed. Uh, skin maceration in three months 
for three months and then vinified with native yeast in French uh, in French in steel and French oak. So uh, there's there's uh, there's a great balance here between the two, um, where the, the stem the, what's done in steel and what's done in French oak, and then they bring it together to see um, what they're gonna what they're gonna um, what the balance of the wine is, it, it, the ultimate balance is. But um, I'd love to hear anybody else. Brent, do you have any comments on this wine at all whatsoever before we move on? And we'll talk about some food pairing too. You know, I think uh, the Bacaro Tinto is a very special story as it comes to a winemaker Shop. team. Oh. We're, we're, we're moving on to the Bacaro next. We're, we're, oh. Goya. we're doing Goya. Oh. It's, right, from so 20, it's from it's from 2020 it's amazing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um okay so let's because oh now i get it that's why you're asking about the blend uh because the the pico is a blend got it got it got it all right there's where the confusion is let's grab um let's grab the pico if you want if you have it in front of you guys the uh picaro d um hold on a second i want to put this in front of you picardia aguilla roberto duero um Again, if you uh, if uh, where up here it says the cosecha, I couldn't find it yesterday. I was looking on the back label. So both are cosechas. Um, let's smell really quickly, and then we'll talk about. Wow, very 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 different. There's no so Brady. This isn't a, this isn't a seven hour wine rave at all. This is actually quite quite different. Um, it's a really elegant nose. Really, uh, really polished. Um, but let's let's taste it first, knowing the first sip doesn't count. So, cheers. Let's just do that. On the heels of the last wine, this wine seems very soft. Mm -hmm. Let's taste it again. Second sip. Cheers. I have a question about your three sips rule. <laughs> it's gonna be a throwdown. Yeah. So, if you were to do like a hundred wines in a day. Do you do the three sips rule every time? So, so as a professional, no, right? Like if I'm tasting, like I like when I wrote the food and wine, wine guide for three years, we had to taste 400 bottles a day. It was insanity. Um, no, we're not doing that because I know what I'm doing, tasting. But I'm saying for 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 consumers, Brady, tell me it doesn't make sense that people will take one sip at a party. You've done it a million times. You pour somebody something. Maybe the pressure's on because you're pouring them something that they think they should like it. They're like, mm, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm like, how could you base it on one sip? You got to try it again. And hopefully we get there by the second sip to measure balance. For me, I am only looking to measure the balance. I, I want to do two sips and just see what I'm tasting. Um, but then I know food's going to change everything. But for me, it's really two sips. The first sip, I never I never give enough uh, weight because I think it still reflects the last wine. So yeah, that's that's where I'm at. But I think adding food is such great, great messaging for everybody especially when I'm talking to consumers, not to the trade, because we don't think that way in America. Like, like Brady, you just came back from Spain last week. Americans don't think like, oh, if I'm pouring this tonight, I have to have that. I need to have this on the table or that on the table. We, we put out some chips and dips and cheeses and crackers or we're making a great dinner, but we're not pairing methodically. And in Europe, the paradigm is wine and food are locked together. There must be certain things together. It's, 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 it's completely opposite of the way we think. Um, I like to joke, we Americans, we think wine is food. It better be delicious or I'm moving on. Like that's that's it. Like it's good, it's delicious. I'm gonna gulp it and drink it and, and have fun with it and I'm moving on. This is like a very blanketed consumerist uh, observation I have, but I've been doing this for years and I really feel that way that people think, oh, you know, I'm gonna drink it and be and, be, and move on. And I say, just pause and take a potato chip. Have, we're not talking, you don't need caviar and foie gras here, a potato chip and taste that wine one more time and see what happens. And everything changes, all bets are off. So. Um, I have I've had this uh, this this, this uh, conversation before with other esteemed um, wine dudes like yourself, and I will I'm going to hold steady on my three sips because I think it really resonates. And the people I've I've been uh, pandemicking with all these tastings later have written me over and over again saying I never ever thought about how important it is to taste the wine again with food to see what happens, and then taste it throughout the you know throughout the day with other foods too. There's no perfect pairings. There is no perfect pairing in my, my, I think as long as there's something in the glass and something on the plate, we're off to a great start. It's better than a glass of water. That's, that's, that's the ultimate, the ultimate um, <laughs> final. But um, Brady, I want to go back to what you asked about the, the blend in this one. So we have Tempranillo, of course, the king, the king of, of, of Rivera, um, but it's also with um, Albillo, Garnacha, and Bobal. So fruit strictly selected from parcels chosen for their quality. Um, in warmer years, 
Um, cooler sites are favored, but in this vintage, they uh, they they chose um, from uh, from uh, sites that had a little more a little more uh, heat and clay. Uh, this wine, to me, is is gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous representation of 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 the style. Um, it was uh, it was twelve to twenty months in French oak barrels, no racking, um, certified organic, and a beautiful wine from sixty year old vines. Any thoughts? Brady. I know, uh, I know my friend here has a question for you, Anthony. Are we going, are we going back to the three sips? No, no, it's not, it's not three sips. Hey, Anthony, Javier here. I got a really quick question. So Hi, coming Javier. up, coming off the Goyo, I like, I, it's a fantastic flavor immediately going into this one on the nose. I got something really weird, which was almost like a yellow cake frosting. Like there was a sweetness that I smelled immediately off the nose, which threw off everything that I was thinking about before I even took a sip. What was that? Huh? Yellow cake. That's such an interesting, I've never heard that before. That's it's just like sweet, like, like just hard sugar. Like, I guess is what I'm trying to say oh, gosh, like when I, what? because I'm yeah. not, because I'm not a really big, like a, a sweet eater immediately. I, I identified that there was like heavy sugar, some <clears throat> sort of a, a scent. Right. Whether that was uh, frosting, whether that was yellow cake, but right. so it was just really bizarre. And I, and I immediately said, this is not something that's common. What is it? And then when I tasted it, I was like, okay, that's not what I expected when I tasted it. It's beautiful. It's balanced. It's, you know, really nice. But I just, I, I didn't know where to go with that. Right. So, so that sweetness to me, again, and, and, and by the way, guys, this is the power of, of suggestion and you all know it. Everyone smell that wine again, number four, if you have it. And there it is. There's a, there is a sweetness on there. And now you have me thinking of like cupcake frosting, but sweetness to me, as it comes through, is oak, and that is the sweetness of oak, and it could bring, it could really, really affect a wine uh, how it how it smells. So for me, this is in French oak, um, twenty months uh, oak barrels. I don't know the, the you know the level of toasting or 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 not medium, but, right? Medium, right? Medium. So like right, so medium medium oak is going to impart uh, a sweetness to the wines too. I mean. Brady, I, 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 do you agree with that or, or not? Absolutely. I think you start to pick up some some cotton candy, like the yellow cake is something new for me to hear, but I definitely see that. Want to drop it in the Rolodex cards. Um, but there is that kind of granule sugar pasty kind of sweetness. And I think yellow cake and cotton candy can follow together. And I, I'll tell you, there's some wines that some Burgundy is like the Domino is a vineyard that I've always appreciated. And I call, I consider that a cotton candy vineyard. So yes. hey, yeah, Brady, Brady, a, a, a quick comment from our friends on Instagram. You have the phone uh, aimed at the screen rather than at yourself. People want to see you, the guy with the sexy gravelly voice talking. Can you end the phone at yourself for a second? All right. There, Brady, we come. also got some comments about chocolate syrup and raspberries from Aaron, who's hanging out with Steph. I get chocolate syrup. And by the way, for the record, I said something cakey and my wife said yellow cake. And I was like, yeah, that's right. Yellow cake. Oh, it's, so it's just, that was really not my, you know. Just no, but yellow, yellow cake is interesting because then you immediately made me think of, of frost, made me think of frosting. And that, that really yeah. hit me because it's, yeah, yellow cake would have frosting on it. And like, that's a sweetness. But again, guys, this is all like a game we play with, um, with um, when we taste together and we start saying like, oh, what do you smell? Everybody, what do you have? Um, who's going to say wet dog? Who's going to say concrete? Who's going to say sweet raspberry frosting? We all start to process. We all start to process it, and we start to taste communally. It's what makes the world go around. Like I think it's amazing. We sometimes we arrive at things like before we we smelled it, and all of a sudden we get the suggestion, and it is the power of suggestion. But it makes us think, "Wow, that's interesting. I really like that." Well, and you know the the game, Anthony. For me, has always been how many Rolodex cards do you have in your brain? Right. Mm -hmm. And my when I was doing a tastings for our friends and family and clients was when was the last time you smelled a green apple? Because a green apple does not smell like it tastes like. Yeah, yeah. there's a huge difference there. And people need to refresh those cards every once in a while. And if you don't smell cotton candy and then drink some wine. <laughs> right, right. But Brady, you know, it's also like interesting, like um, uh, you brought up a point like that. I say, um, think about like if we had Laura on the line with us, Laura Worland, um, she's, she's lady, 
uh, who's a good friend of ours with the Ribera and Rueda campaign, Ribera would talk about the stinkiest cheeses. Those like, you know, people was like, oh my God, this cheese, some of these cheeses are really stinky, um, yet they taste amazing. Like, it's just about like, what the nose says doesn't correlate what the taste is. Like, so there's, sometimes it's just, it might be, like you said, it's on that index card. Like that's, um, for me, that's a signpost of where I'm heading. Oh, wow, this has got that really funky, mushroomy, wacky nose that I'm, I'm, I've smelled in some cheese. <laughs> Um, maybe some crazy triple creme or something like that. But then when I taste, it's like, oh my God, it's like the greatest butter I've ever had in my life on, on toast. Like, so um, I, I say like w wines can smell really funky. You know, we, as journalists, we have to clean up um, barnyard is an aroma we throw out there in a lot of wine reviews, but let's be honest, it's really manure. It's like the wine smells like fresh tilled manure in the soil. Like it's crap, literally crap. Uh, 44. And, 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 and Brady, we talked about, uh, you were talking about Sancerre earlier. Uh, we, you, you, we were talking about lookalike for, uh, for the, for Dejos. Um, Sancerre can often smell like cat pee. I mean, like there's nothing escape. There's no way to escape that aroma in certain wines oh, from wow. Roy Valley. And you're like, well, but feel like, why would I want to drink that? I'm like, cause it's, it tells us where it's from, but it doesn't taste like that. I mean, it tastes delicious. So like, it's like stinky cheese. It just, it is what it is, but it might be something that helps us uh, put a put a bookmark there and then we keep moving. And that's, I think, an important thing to remember when, you know, you kind of go back to the beginning of the conversations tonight, Anthony, where you're like, I really want to take sip one, sip two, and sip three is like, if I don't like it, maybe I need some food yep. to really appreciate. But I think the really the wild card here is when you're wanting to appreciate something, you can't write it off until you've had dinner with them. You know, it's like I met you at a rave. Maybe you suck. <laughs> <laughs> then I picked you up and dropped you off. But really, we should have dinner to really see if we're a good compatible <laughs> conversation. Wow. And that's with food. And you got to just test all the waters to really determine but if you like something you're the you're the end all be all i mean it's what you are it's not what we say right yeah. Yeah. but the thing is if you're going to be the end all be all just make sure you memorize those flavor cards and put them in your rolodex for the next day because you will end up calling on them again and again to make those quick decisions of like tonight i'm going to have a to what am i going to order for dinner tonight i'm having ribera what am i going to order for my main you know and that's where you you come to be successor yeah 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 i'm with you i'm with you man um all right, I want to just because uh, Laura did this. Laura sent me these amazing cheese pairings. I mean, there's by the way, there's food pairings at Galore. And you could I find all this on the, the Drink Real Spain site uh, for potential food pairings. But I think it's important. We're just talking about a lot of cheese um, for Crianza and Hoven style Tempranillos uh, with a minimum of one year in barrel age. Uh, you want to look for something like a Monte Anebro, um, lightly smoked, uh, fruity, mild cheeses, Cabra Romero, Manchego, like a six month that's not quite newborn, but not quite aged. Um, and a San Simon, um, a Reserva, which is, you know, at least two years of age in bottle and one in year in, 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 in sorry, two years in, in bottle, one in oak. Um, these would be a uh, little more umami, piquant, nutty cheeses like Idiazabal, uh, Zamorano, Mahon, had a beautiful Mahon last night, um, Beecher's Flagship and Iboris, and then Grand Reserva by decree, two years in barrel and three years in bottle and more. Um, you want something a little more savory, Something with balanced sweetness, like a, a Cabot cloth bound cheddar, a beautiful 12 month Manchego, or a gorgeous uh, California Point Reyes Bay Blue. The Casechas, uh, you know, the challenges is like these, these styles have no style. They're all over the place as the wild card. So the styles can be all over the place. But, you know, I would say um, they're hard to, to, to say, oh, this is the best cheese you should have. Um, I would think if the wine shows a little bit big, bigger and fuller, um, you want to do something more aged, like one of those like you know, 12 month Manchegos, something like that. Um, but uh, again, I would think of if I was pairing food in general, think of Bordeaux, think of Burgundy, think of Piedmont and think of Napa. And, and that's where I'm going to I'm going to say, Brady, what else do you want to talk about before we let these fine people go party and rave and dance? Pretty rude. <laughs> Is, wait, uh, did we start a wine rave? Yeah. We did. start. I mean, you started a wine rave earlier. I mean, we just, we, we just well, this is the this is the, the build up. I have, uh, I have one guest tonight, and I want to thank everybody for who was here tonight and bought the wines and participated. But this is a good thing for like getting like three or four friends together and like sitting down and trying to share these wines because otherwise you're going to feel guilty. 
There's no way to drink four bottles of wine as a human solo. Unless, well, unless it's like a Saturday at 6 p.m. But I mean, I just, I've just i heard. <laughs> wine raver. So um, Ollie, one of our guests tonight, might have a question for you, Anthony. Do you want to drop in? What's that? One question? No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious about them. Summer. How you doing? Summer. Ollie, uh, uh, here and here. Hi, Ali. Uh, the household of Javier. I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, just curious as, as as to the to the blend, and then what what do you think the attributing factors of each of those blends are? The Grenache versus the Baval. Uh, I think there's something else in there as well. Uh, Tempranillo. Tempranillo number uh, one. Navi and my or my or the white. Yeah. Um, and then is is it simply just is it is it just a is it a structural uh, blending? Is it, is it more for the flavor? Uh, and, um, well, for, for this producer, it's tradition. They've always blended. It's not just 100% Tempranillo. So they, they have a tradition of blending and they're, they're 60 year old vines. So, stuff, this is like, you know, this is old school winemaking in this region. And back then, there was a lot more blending going on before, you know, everything was sorted out by the DOs to say, like, this has to be 100% Tempranillo or this doesn't or et cetera. Um, so, you had a lot more field blends back then. Um, and, and even in American winemaking until the 1980s was was much more field blendy. Americans, like I said, we're stuck on grape. We need to know the grape. We want to know the grape. We feel better knowing the grape. But blending is done around the world. In this part of, in this little tiny corner of Ribera, they've been blending for, you know, for since the 1980s. And they, like, and, well, sorry, uh, the, this winery started in the 1980s, but they have 60 old vines. So clearly there was a chapter before this that we don't know about. Um, and they, they, they're not ripping anything out to say, oh, we should only be doing Tempranillo. They're adding a little garnacha and a little bobal and, and building these beautiful wines. And it changes from vintage to vintage what they think it needs. And it's like great Bordeaux. You adjust the, the, the blend or the cepage every vintage with what's showing better and what's going to add, uh, you know, fruitiness and flavor and longevity to these wines. So I hope yeah. that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, to tag on to that, the longevity is something that's very important to these guys. Yeah. They want us, they want to see something that's going to perform. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Team Steph. I see I can't see many of the squares tonight, but Steph, you guys gave a big uh, a big roof raising cheers before. So <laughs> thank you. So there, so so uh Brady, that's the rave that's getting started. I think they're gonna kick off the rave. Dude, I want to rave with you ladies tonight. What's up? Where are you? They're in Denver, they're friends of mine. Oh, hell yeah. Well, <laughs> we're in Atlanta. Fantastic. Fantastic. I wish we had like those uh, portals that just yeah. like connect us. And by portals, you're talking Star Trek, not Star not, Trek not, shit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think we should close it out here and just say you have, you have four bottles. They're not empty, I hope, yet. And so that means there's a few more hours of enjoyment. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. But guys, go to Ribera and, uh, and, 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 and sorry, real, uh, drinkrealspain.com and Look for uh, look to sign up for for the monthly uh, notices of the new packages. Um, Brady, am I going to be back anytime soon? I want I want to do this again with you guys. I, I love the last two we did together. I'd yeah, because like to I think we've got um, between you and I. I'm taking off a couple months for Drink Real Spain to focus on events because it's event season come up. So I'm going to be hanging out with you in Aspen yes. and dragging you into some raves, yeah. and then also uh, Healdsburg. So we'll come back with uh, Drink Real Spain sometime in June and launch. At that point, we'll have all of our retailers, partners, buddies, hosts, and everything. So yeah, we'll do a few more in the coming 10 months after uh, we come back from a two-month hiatus. Okay. So yeah, that's the game plan. Next month, we've got some really cool wines. We've got a 2013 Verdejo, a 2018 Verdejo, and then two beautiful reds. And we're going to talk about age statement in the coming months. So um, we're going to send you wines, Anthony, just so you can uh, play along. And if you want to drink with me offline or online, I'm here. Awesome. Well, awesome fun. But thanks, man. Thank you again for everything, as always. Drinkrealspain.com. Let's do it. Cheers, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And Mr. Stephen McConnell, who you guys saw tonight, he's going to be there next uh, month hanging out. He's going to be our Anthony in charge. Every month we're going to kind of like swap around and find some new sexy <laughs> men to hang out with. <laughs> and uh, Steven, be ready for a stump or two. I'm going to like throw you some bombs. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. Awesome. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.